you once again on this study on workshop on good management practices for energy efficient buildings by introducing passive cooling designs to reduce operational costs and improve health and comfort and promote use of non cfc and low gwp alternatives it is inevitable that to reduce carbon emissions the construction industry will have to play a major role since increase in cooling capacity in this segment are expected to grow much faster than in the industrial or other segments of the economy by 2030 it is expected that in the building cooling capacity required will grow fourfold as compared to 2020 to take steps to rapidly start implementation of measures needed cidc has joined hands through a memorandum of association with the ozone cell of ministry of environment forest and climate change to interact with all stakeholders in the indian construction industry this workshop is the first in a series of such workshops and to have smooth functioning of the workshop i request all of you to keep yourself muted we will have the question answer session at the end you can send messages your questions on message on the chat box or raise your hands after uh, the session thus all lectures are over to start the program i would like to invite dr p r sroop to give the opening remarks dr p r sroop is the director general construction industry development council and also the member secretary planning boards of government of tripura and the union territory of ladakh dr sroop i welcome you thank you dr kumar and i welcome shri aditya narayan singh scientist e with the ozone cell of uh, ministry of environment forest and climate change government of india and uh, shri vikramurthy uh, who is the director of univac environment systems private limited and he had been associated with ishre for a very long time and the artificial climate control is something in which he is considered to be one of the foremost experts in the country i welcome shri akash ji from dairy uh, who is actually the senior program manager dr narayan swarup who is the director general of indian society for trench test technology and who has done extensive work on uh, creating a manual of embodied energy and then of course other eminent speakers academicians architects engineers and of course the industry representatives it's good to be among you and uh, i'm so happy to inform that there has been an overwhelming response for this call that we sent all across and this issue is also equally important for a very simple reason that construction industry very correctly is perceived as the one who are the biggest pollution creators and when it comes to the kind of urban as well as rural settings i think the functioning requires a lot of attention and the carbon footprints that are being generated that is something that is a matter of concern and matter of concern not only nationally but also on account of the kind of uh, international protocols that the country has signed and i think uh, this is a laudable step that has been taken by ozone cell to initiate this process which will begin with the awareness which will look into various other aspects as to how exactly this menace can be handled and solved and we have variety of experts who are here and that's the issue now let us look at uh, the kind of profile of those who are needed to solve this particular problem as it is understood the consultants have to play a very important role architects and consultants they have to play an important role we need to have uh, you know the teachers who are building up the career of the young practitioners who are ultimately going to the industry and their functioning needs basically toning up here and the kind of inputs that have to be given to them and top it all we require constituents from the industry because they are the ones who are responsible for disseminating this information and adopting it in their work practices for that matter there are other two segments which are equally important in case we wish to really 
do something constructive and positive on this particular important issue. This is basically the regulatory agencies, and I think MOEF is actually taking this role with how uh, Mr. Aditya Singh is here with us. He'll be also speaking out his mind. We also need to have many of the project authorities who should come in there so that the regulatory systems, they need a little bit of uh, tweaking and change because unless that is done, the functioning will remain as it is on the old uh, systems and methods for that matter. New systems have to be devised. And in this whole context, we require a vast network of laboratories and research units and that's why I welcome many of the educational institutions. Many of them are already engaged in this kind of work, disseminating the information, conducting researches on it. But I think this is the time that we should have a cogent network of these laboratories. Just to give you a very simple uh, calculation, All India Council for Technical Education itself, under their uh, authorizations, they have more than 4,000 colleges who are working with them. And each of the college has at least about 20 laboratories. They're spread throughout the country. And in case we want to make it a national movement, we certainly be needing the involvement and integral involvement of all these institutions. So I'm very happy to share with you that number of research scientists and many of the professors, they have also joined today's meeting, which is a very heartening thing because these professors have a dual role to play. They are also acting as consultants. They are also advising the local authorities on a variety of issues. May they be structural design, may they be setting up of the uh, standard operating procedures, may that be quality control and several other things. So I think we have a full complement of people. And although we have a registration of over 300, I can see that almost about 200 have already joined and many more are likely to be joining during the course of the discussions that we have. What are the things that we need to do? The first thing that we have to really look into is the existing system of uh, uh, you know, making an assessment as to how the functioning can be converted into green functioning. And I am basically coming to a situation where I'm saying that we have a few green rating models that are available. And of course, Griha is with us. They will be speaking about it. But there is one very major issue that lacks still. And that is that the you know, incidence of embodied energy has to be taken into account. Uh, the whole green rating system that revolves around artificial uh, climate control, that uh, revolves around uh, utilizing the solar power and things like that, but in the whole process, the kind of materials that are being used for construction, they are energy guzzlers. And ultimately, we are looking at the total stock. So I think this is one of the issues on which uh, the August gathering will have to basically react and speak about it. We need to resort to extensive training and extensive training starting from the workers level for that matter. You know, they should be made conscious as to what are the things that need to be done how the kind of debris is to be recycled, how the water consumption has to be reduced, how can the water consumption be uh, out of uh, recycled water, and issues such as that. And this basically covers the vast number of people who are working as uh, the, the hand-on workers on various project sites and their supervisors. Of course, the engineers cannot remain away from this, and they also have to be made very conscious. So extensive training at all levels will have to be adopted. I, I, I feel that this is the first step that we are taking, and this is just a kind of an introductory training that is going to come to all of us. And later on, we'll try to expand it and convert that into some kind of focused training programs for various segments that we have there. Very important issue that we have to really look at are the procurement systems as to what kind of procurement systems the government follows. Let me share this example with you. Almost 26 years ago, when CIDC was formed, we were given a four-point mandate. And one of the most important points there was that the construction workers, they need to be skilled and trained. And believe you me, friends, 
it was a tough journey for all this quarter of a century. Uh, although everybody wanted to have it, but fact of the matter was that there were hardly any investments available. The governments were planning to get into this kind of a thing so that you know the funding can be provided and this project can really take off. But then I'm very happy to say that after having worked for almost 25, 26 years as one of the pioneers, CIDC has been able to bring it to a stage where it has become a national flagship program with number of skilling initiatives going throughout the country. And there are regulatory measures, regulatory provisions that have been created. I give an example of Central Public Works Department and another 76 organizations who have now made it a mandatory condition that the workmen who will be engaged and employed on their sites, they need to have a, a valid skill certification. And that has really uh, given a great spur to this particular movement. I will translate that in terms of the initiative that we have to take. I think there are a number of ministries who are involved with this particular issue. And I think as a sequel, ultimately, we should be in a position to rope in all the ministries who can come and make necessary amendments and changes in their procurement systems as well. Existing systems have to be reviewed, as I have already told you. And the awareness, even in the minds of consumers, will have to be raised. They also need to understand that they cannot continue playing with the environment, so they should be demanding certain uh, methods, certain procedures, and last but not the least. These methods and procedures need to be evolved and created. So I think there is a great amount of work ahead, and I would expect that all the participants who are here, I would request them to feel free to be part of this particular group, which is going to be taking in. And I'm very sure this is going to grow into a very mighty force. And we will be in a position to achieve the things. After all, what is there that Indians can't achieve? So I'm absolutely certain that even this menace will be fought and we will win this battle very well. Thank you so very much. And I think uh, uh, this is the time to uh, listen to Mr. Aditya Singh. And I'm handing it over to Dr. Kumar and Mr. Singh, you are most welcome to speak out and give the kind of uh, concept and the kind of background with which this particular initiative has been started. Ms. Aditya Singh, please. Thank you, Dr. Suruk. And we set the ball rolling. And now I'm inviting Sri Aditya Narayan Singh Ji, who's the additional director, Ozone Cell, Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, Government of India. Uh, welcome, sir. Good. Uh, thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Now I am laudable. Can you yes, hear? Sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Dr. P. R. Saru, uh, Director General, uh, Construction Industry Development Council, uh, Sri Vikram Murthy, Dr. Nirajan uh, Saru, Sri Akash Deep. Uh, participants from architecture, engineering colleges, urban planning policy makers, architects, building developers, building development association, etc. Uh, distinguished uh, participants, ladies and gentlemen, very good morning to all. At the outset, I would like to extend my heartiest warm welcome to all of you for participating in the regional workshop on good management practices for. Uh -huh efficient buildings by introducing passive cooling design. As you all may be aware that the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change is an administrative department under Government of India for planning, promoting, coordinating and overseeing the implementation of environmental and forest and program in the country. Uh, there are uh, various global environmental issues such as climate change and depletion of ozone layer and also there are local environmental issues such as air pollution, water pollution and waste generation uh, that is uh, municipal garbage, uh, uh, industrial hazardous waste, construction and demolition waste, electronic waste, biomedical waste, etc. which have adverse impact on human health fauna. 
there are several uh, pollution related issues associated with the building project during construction and operation stage and chances of emission if control measures are not taken uh, dust such as dust emission occur from storage of uh, building material as well as cutting and grinding of building construction material during construction uh, there is also significant water requirement or water demand for various household building as well as commercial building as per the cphu manual or national building code which may be in the range of 135 liter per capita per day to 250 liter per capita per day accordingly for management of waste water sewage treatment plant or effluent treatment plant is installed to treat the effluent and treated effluent can be recycled for beneficial purposes so that requirement for fresh water can be reduced and also rain water harvesting structure is provided to recharge the ground water per capita per day municipal solid waste generation is in the range of 0.17 kg to 600 gram depending upon size of city and the municipal solid waste is also segregated into dry and waste wet waste to manage it and to tackle the waste problem a uh, treatment facility to be provided for waste for wet waste at so and for development project a proper management of construction and demolition waste is also needed a uh, recovered uh, material is reused in the building project based on its usage and so there is also an urgent need for moving toward best uh, environmental practices for reducing emission as well as pollution level to tackle with this local environmental issues the ministry has formulated several acts and rules such as uh, environmental uh, protection act 1986 air and water act solid waste management rules biomedical waste management rule hazardous and other waste management and transboundary movement rules construction and demolition waste management rules and all this information is for youngsters i mean the student who are participating in the workshop and uh, other senior professional might be aware about all these environmental issues today we are not getting into the details of all these issues but i just want to touch all this information to get feeling of various environmental issues associated with the building construction and pollution control measures involved in this regard today we are joining here to discuss other aspect of building project that is to improve energy efficiency of various type of building to tackle the issues of global level there are international convention and protocols such as uh, united nations framework convention on climate change and its kyoto protocol paris agreement and vienna convention montreal protocol for production of ozone layer just for the knowledge of participants i would like to inform that ozone cell is the nodal division of the ministry of environment forest and climate change for implementation of the montreal protocol in india i also like to give you brief about montreal protocol uh, montreal protocol is an international treaty for the protection of ozone layer and this ozone layer exists between 10 to 50 km above the earth atmosphere and the ozone layer is vital to life on the earth and it acts as shields to prevent the harmful ultraviolet rays from reaching the earth the mandate of the montreal protocol is to phase out the production and consumption of ozone depleting substance for controlled purposes and the ozone depleting substance are man made chemical which are responsible for the depletion of the ozone layer the odds are man made chemical which are responsible for the depletion of ozone layer and this chemical containing chlorine and bromine enter into the atmosphere and reach that A stratosphere, uh, where these chemicals are broken down by the high energy solar ultraviolet radiation and release extremely reactive chlorine and bromine atoms. These reactive chlorine and bromine reacts with ozone and retard the formation of ozone, which are leading to destruction of ozone layer. These uh, chemicals are chlorofluorocarbon, 
hydrochlorofluorocarbon which are used as refrigerant carbon tetrachloride used as solvent and or clinic agent and halon used for uh, fire extinguishers etc depletion of ozone layer leads to many harmful ill effects including uh, skin cancer eye cataract loss of flora and fauna material damage montel protocol is also responsible for awareness and capacity building as a part of implementation project including conducting workshop for concerned stakeholders such as building sector which also account for consumption of ozone depleting substance in the form of refrigerant as most of you are aware india is one of first countries in the world to launch a comprehensive cooling action plan with the objective to reduce the cooling demand to reduce the energy demand and to reduce refrigerant demand which has a long term vision to address the cooling requirement across sectors including in residential and commercial buildings as per icap report in 2017 approximately 272 million households were estimated in india which will increase to 328 million in 2027 and 386 million in 2037 the commercial sector floor area is expected to grow around 1.5 to 2 times in the next decade and 2.5 to 3 times by 2037 and 38 the icap also estimates that the aggregate nationwide cooling demand in tonnage of refrigeration is projected to grow 8 times by 2037 38 as compared to 2017-18 baseline out of which the building sector cooling demand shows a significant growth or uh, at nearly 11 times the constant scenario in the icap suggests that through proactive measures the total refrigerant demand can be reduced by 25% to 30% and cooling energy requirement by 25 to 40% respectively by the year 2037 and 38 A tonnage of a refrigeration reduction potential around 13% could be realized through more rigorous implementation of energy conservation building code in the upcoming commercial building in the country. A space cooling in building can be improved by adopting passive cooling technologies through improving uh, building envelopes and providing natural ventilation. for building envelopes bureau of energy efficiency has already developed energy conservation building code for commercial building and eco nivas samita for residential building these codes are applicable for commercial buildings including offices airport hospitals educational institute railway and metro station etc ministry of environment and forest has recently developed a launch and launch an action plan to reduce the cooling demand and energy demand in the building sector which include wider adoption of energy conservation building code for commercial building and eco nivas samita for residential building and this action plan is available on the website of the ozone cell noting the recommendation of the icap that adoption of passive cooling technologies in the building sector would significantly help in the reduction of cooling demand and promote energy efficiency the ozone cell of the ministry has initiated this study with the following objective to sensitize both the construction community as well as the user towards benefit of energy efficient building in by incorporating passive cooling design to reduce the operational cost improve health and comfort and to promote use of non scfc and low global warming potential alternatives in active cooling system since cidc is the nodal agency for promoting the construction sector including addressing issues of different stakeholder associated with the construction industry and all the leading construction firm are its member Uh, the ozone cell ministry of environment forest and climate change has associated with cidc in conducting this study 
the purpose of this work workshop is to create awareness among the construction communities including academic institutes regarding the need of enhancing the energy efficiency of the building envelopes by the adoption of ecbc at the same time the aim of the work workshop is also to understand the likely gaps in the construction sector with regard to understanding of adoption of energy efficient concept in the building construction project by the various professionals including architect civil engineer designer supervisor material supplier and mason worker based on the feedback of the construction professional and their assessment good management practice needs to be suggested for the effective implementation of ecbc in the building construction project it is uh, expected that the present study will come out with a specific action points for various stakeholder associated with the construction industry in achieving the objectives of the study and i look forward for successful deliberation and outcome from this workshop thank you thank you mr singh for giving us the idea of all the things that has to be done and for the knowledge gap uh, we we have a questionnaire which we would be sharing with all the participants to understand what should be done and we'd like to have the feedback of everybody now for the keynote speakers i would like to invite shri vikram moti who is the director univac environment systems private limited is also a trustee of tropical air conditioning and refrigeration refrigeration institute and he is the india representative of a air conditioning heating and refrigeration institute he is going to speak on reimagining the built environment mr murthy i welcome you to share your views thank you thank you suchita so i'm very happy to see there are so many people attending and as uh, <coughs> dr priyanjan swaroop said that they are from so many different backgrounds so i see that the problem we have to solve can be solved because there are so many of us here from these different backgrounds uh, architects civil engineers those involved in construction and people like me who are building service engineers only if we combine all our imagination that's why my topic is reimagineering it's just a word i coined so you imagine and you engineer and you reimagine the whole built environment to be completely different from what it is today without abrogating the need for good technology and the good practice because we have a history in india of good practice of buildings it's very old it's very ancient we taught the world how to make great buildings all these years and you can see even modern buildings today are constructed with very good focus and thought about how we can reduce global warming how we can reduce energy consumption uh, aditya narayan singh spoke uh, so uh, eloquently about reducing cooling demand so reducing cooling demand is by many ways so i think i will start now about what i want to say historically here is a picture i will just put on a pointer so i can uh, better be able to explain what i want to say so this is a palace in rajasthan built many many years ago there are many palaces like this across india there are even smaller buildings which are built in the same fashion for what it is doing so it's very hot over there in the summer it is 43 degrees centigrade but we are blessed in india for many parts of india which when you have a very hot dry bulb temperature you have a very low drop low bulb temperature in many of the hot and dry places of india so it's the difference between these two which can allow us to do evaporative cooling so in this building there's a reservoir constructed far behind and by gravity the water flows and it goes out of these fountains which are now defunct but these fountains spray the cool 23 degree mist all around the palace and evaporation aided by natural winds cool that palace in the hot summer without any energy cooling by evaporation so we have history so the india cooling action plan i'm just focusing about the goal set for reducing overall cooling demand in the next 20 years and so that's what uh, really i am going to speak about reducing the demand of course uh, the companies which manufacture air conditioners the be and everybody else 
is doing very well to make energy efficiency the main focus, but we can reduce demand. And I think that's what we can all together do. So we are blessed to be living in one of the most beautiful and geographically uh, blessed countries of the world. We have 7,000 kilometers of coastline, right? And we have parts which are hot and dry, but these hot and dry parts have very low wet bulk temperature. That's the key thing for you to note. And this is the composite part and Delhi is over here. So these parts have long winters. Uh, Dr. Singh is wearing uh, winter clothes and so is Priyanjan Swaroop. I am in Mumbai. It is still very cool in the 1st of February in Mumbai. So we are having long winters, but you don't require cooling. We have hot and dry, which can use evaporative cooling. We have warm climates over here, which don't require excessive cooling if you learn how to understand weather. And I will speak about that a little later. So this is the whole thing that we should take advantage of our wonderful geography and the composite land in which we live to be able to cool in a more natural way. Over 60% of Indians stay cool with a fan in summer. They offer good comfort inside shaded spaces and their use must be encouraged instead of air conditioning. So we must discourage air conditioning when the temperatures are below 33 degrees. Uh, you know, if, if they come below 33 degrees, you don't need air conditioning. Similarly, in a dry climate, 34, 35 degrees with a good fan will give you very good comfort. And of course, if these fans have uh, brushless DC motors, energy can uh, come down drastically. We must look at the increased use of very efficient fans allow ventilation to happen naturally when it is not very hot. So evaporative coolers. So we are focusing a lot, uh, many of us here uh, who are building service engineers to encourage the use of evaporative coolers, which are very efficient, not very crudely constructed ones, but very highly efficient ones. We now have a very good tool to tell you where to put evaporative cooling and how to do it. It offers a low energy cooling solution and simultaneous ventilation for most homes and commercial applications. Now there are two stage coolers which can further reduce the temperatures below the wet bulb. So if you have a wet bulb of 24, 25, you can achieve 19, 20 degrees centigrade by two stage evaporative cooling. And that's something we should explore. And if you want to go for a third stage, go for air conditioning, but then the load will come down to every 20 or 30 percent. Uh, another uh, very good way of doing cooling is really radiant cooling. So let us understand, why do we feel hot inside the building? We feel hot inside the building because we allow the heat of the day to come inside the building. Then we close all the windows and doors and we remain like inside an oven. And then we put on air conditioning to try and take out this heat. And very little of the air conditioner is doing the cooling for the human body. Most of it is trying to extract the heat from the room, right? because of what you've allowed to come inside. So the old buildings and even the modern buildings, if you take advantage, like the ECBC says, of doing good insulation, of using good construction materials, allowing the wind to take away the heat, uh, high emissivity outside surfaces, there are many things civil engineers and architects can do. But if you cool by allowing pipes inside a room on the floor, on the roof, you don't have to cool the whole space the human body automatically radiates heat to anything which is cool or takes in heat for anything which is warm. That's why you feel hot inside the building. And if you have pipes like this, you will, you will feel cool very fast. And this is applied in a very big way in cities of Hyderabad and many other parts of South India. Uh, radiant cooling has become very popular mm -hmm. in commercial. The rate of cooling of radiation is proportional to the fourth power of the temperature difference. So let's see the wonderful uh, equation which we have for radiant cooling and so therefore cooling can be very fast if the temperature difference is high and if the area surface available is also high so this is reduces cooling load to as low as 40 percent and we have to encourage that so this is just to tell you that the Taj Mahal is not the buildings we are going to build today but it makes use of what is called structure cooling the Taj is built on a very huge mass of of stone, which gets cooled through the whole winter months. And that allows heat of the summer to be absorbed gently into that thermal mass. Similarly, modern building structures can be cooled by embedded water pipes, transferring daytime extracted heat to the sun, uh, to the sky in the night, because the night sky is at minus 40 degrees centigrade. 
and of course you can have high emissivity building surfaces so many things we can do build to take advantage of the local climate so the local climate you must understand by studying weather data i will tell you a little more about that towards the end but climate can determine how passive building strategies can use high thermal mass and we can use natural and installed insulation construction materials windows on shaded facades uh, setback windows the use of awnings surrounding trees cool roofs high emissivity reflecting surfaces glass which doesn't allow heat to come in natural wind ventilation evaporating water bodies fountain surrounding the building all of these can create a local climate and uh, uh, so this is happening i'll show you some pictures now it is also the design of the new buildings on the central vista which will take advantage of all these things uh, and therefore the building load comes down substantially so this is the bahai temple in delhi of course it's a monument it's not a commercial building it's not a residential building but it takes advantage of allowing the big temp uh, height difference to allow wind to be swept in uh, by natural forces and of course there are trees evaporative bodies and all these things around over here so it remains cool all through the summer and this is where i live in the city of mumbai this is a very old building it's it is uh, uh, it's very popular it is uh, very crowded although the postal services are no longer used for posting letters but the post office has begun to do so many new things now for savings for uh, all sorts of things uh, which are they are reinvented themselves so this building is once again populated it's well ventilated it's cool it's comfortable you never need uh, to think about heat over there and uh, of course there are fans you can see them all around so natural ventilation happens this is a very old train terminus in bombay so with the help of fans natural ventilation high ceilings so public spaces must be allowed to be naturally ventilated the potential for a building to have low energy use is largely determined by the design materials and components used and the quality of construction of the system so so there we are so we can design a building which allows all this to happen uh, the MOAFC ozone cell office is in this building and so this building was built in the early 90s uh, Joseph Allen Stein of Stein Doshi Bhalla designed many iconic buildings in Bombay and so this building takes care of sun breakers it has natural trees growing inside it has set back windows it has very good construction material it uses basements it has a large inside courtyard so many things are there which allow this building to remain cool it houses many offices terry's offices are there uh, many large uh, commercial offices and uh, programs are held over here so the fossil energy consumption of a building can be further reduced by integrating solar electricity generators i won't speak much about this because you know solar energy can bring down grid energy substantially but you can use all the parts of the building the parking lots the roofs and many other places now there are vertically mounted uh, solar panels which have become popular so that's uh, more pictures of the same building and now uh, recently uh, we uh, in our society have been talking with one organization in singapore uh, who is developing self adaptive glass using layers of vanadium dioxide nanoparticle composites low emissivity coating to form a unique structure this structure has no electrical components but when it is hot outside it doesn't allow the heat to come in when it's cold inside it doesn't allow the heat to go out it adapts very quickly and it is it's uh, it has an amazing promising future for glass so here something i wish to tell you whatever i've said so far so evaporative cooling we must understand this whole thing about thermal comfort we have recently published a paper on thermal comfort if we understand thermal comfort we would have solved this problem we have spent the last 50 years doing artificial forms and mechanical forms of air conditioning but really speaking thermal comfort is all about me and you and how we understand comfort and so that's not difficult to understand once we know what are the ways in which we can keep more comfortable more easily 90% of india doesn't have access to air conditioning how do we make them cool so thermal comfort for all is something we must think about and it's not difficult if you apply our minds we are doing some research right now about thermal comfort for self constructed buildings which can be easily achieved by them so i want to show you one map over here uh, this is a picture of uh, our recently uh, not recently but we this book has been around for a long time it's about weather data 
but we are releasing now very soon in a month or two 200 cities by the data of india right now only 60 are there so this is the city of amravati which is uh, one of the capitals of andhra pradesh in south india so you so see this is a map of the temperature similarly there are maps of uh, wet bulb and humidity but i'm just showing you uh, these are the hours of the day these are the months of the year and this is the temperature going from 5 to 50 degrees centigrade so if you see the whole year all the hours and all the months and the red portions are above 35 degrees centigrade actually it forms a very small number of hours in 8760 hours of the year but what do we do we allow this hot heat which comes in the afternoon to remain inside our building till the whole evening that's where the problem comes if we knew how to tackle uh, the weather we would never have this problem and most of our buildings will not need air conditioning and there will be lots of hours where we don't need to cool so extensively and so understanding the weather is a very key thing to designing a good building so this is what i want to say about adapting to comfort humans have an inherent ability to adapt to climate this has eroded with the comfort available from decades of mechanical cooling and heating it's not that mechanical and cooling and heating is bad we must find ways to reduce the need for them in the way we construct buildings and in the way we understand weather and in the way we can use nature ventilation evaporative cooling uh, passive methods and so many other methods are there and all of us can work towards that and all these methods can be adapted to the use of self-constructed homes and people who will never have access to mechanical cooling the use of appropriate clothing setting indoor cooling temperature set points during the pandemic uh, our society is recommended that you should be between 24 and 30 degrees you be closer to 30 when you live in a dry climate and you be closer to 24 when you live a humid climate based on your uh, humidity use circulating fans there's no need uh, to put off the fans when you have air conditioning you will find a huge benefit by running fans while air conditioning is there you won't have to keep the temperature so low and you put on this uh, mechanical air conditioning only when the temperature goes above 35 degrees in dry climates or below 33 degrees in humid climates. Now you might think this is very foolish. The reason why you cannot do it is because you allowed the heat to come inside in the first place. If you didn't allow that, if you built better, this would never happen, right? So what is adaptive comfort? Uh, we've explained that to some extent to you. So electric compressor driven air conditioning is not the only means to provide adequate thermal comfort during the summer. We are an intelligent species, all of us over here. We are the only intelligent species on Earth. We must develop and apply conscious and responsible behavior to drastically reduce the use of building energy to prevent destructive climate changes. This is something we have to do. We have no choice except that we have to do it. Uh, most of us uh, have the privilege of having access to mechanical air conditioning and other methods of comfort. What about the rest of India? What about your brothers and your sisters who serve you, who work for you? The urban poor struggle everywhere they go. In the villages, they can sit under a tree. They can sit by the water side, perhaps, uh, if they have food to eat. But otherwise, in the cities, they just struggle. So the ICAP recommends targeted programs to enable thermal comfort for all. Economically weaker sections should be a priority. And so uh, me and some uh, of our colleagues are working on two things thermal comfort in self-constructed homes and good air quality in the same self-constructed room. They're two different projects, but uh, we, we hope that we'll be able to uh, expand on that and make that available to all the states of India with the help of Ministry of Environment. With extreme heat, areas of high relative humidity and a significant portion of the population with limited access to air conditioning, just 9% of Indian homes now. It will remain 9% because more homes, as Aditya Narayan Singh said, are being built, more and more homes, and more and more people will go for air conditioning, but it will still be 9-12% only. How does one provide thermal comfort to all in a sustainable fashion? So I thank you very much for listening patiently to me. I think I will do better to answer questions and not speak for much longer. So I'll stop my share now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Murthy. It's very enlightening. There are things that really can be implemented, but what we feel is those who are constructing their things, they are not aware. So this message has to go to everybody.
and thank you for sharing your things. So now I'd like to invite Dr. Niranjan Sarup. Dr. Niranjan Sarup is the Director General of Indian Society for Transverse Technology. As Dr. Sarup, we are sort of mentioned that he has worked extensively on embodied energy used in construction material. And he would be speaking on good management practices for smaller carbon footprints. Dr. Niranjan, I like you. An extension of the business, what I conduct. In fact, one of the things is the CCGR, that is CIDC Comprehensive Green Rating. And this particular ozone cell concept of uh, good practices or good management practices gels very well with that. We are talking about conserving energy or saving energy while we are using the facility. In fact, what we need is a comprehensive uh, database or comprehensive reportage of a building starting from the cradle to grave. When I start constructing my building till I uh, come uh, end using it, till that time, whatever energy which I have invested or spent on that must be comprehensive and must be the least one. And that is what would give us the best solution. My presentation is in that direction. The background is the carbon footprint is the total greenhouse gas emissions caused by an individual event, organization, service, place, or product expressed as carbon dioxide equivalent. Smaller the footprint, lesser the environmental impact. For buildings, such footprints get generated during construction activities, occupation or usage of such edifices. To reduce the overall carbon footprints, we need energy efficient structures designed and constructed, adopting green construction practices which function in the expected ways so that the consumption of energy later also is contained. And that is where our passive cooling concepts come in. Two main major management approaches therefore include green building construction process and passive cooling approach. We'll be talking about these two. The green building construction process refers to the application of processes that are environmentally responsible and resource efficient throughout the building's life cycle, from planning to design, construction, operation, maintenance, renovation, and finally, demolition, the complete life cycle what we are talking. The passive cooling means using design approaches to reduce heat gain and increase uh, the heat loss. So if I want to cool my structure passively, that basically means I would be uh, in reducing the heat gain and letting the heat loss enhance. A combination of these two approaches can produce an energy efficient structure, have <clears throat> structure having most optimum carbon footprints. Now, just briefly speaking, when I'm talking about green construction, it addresses or it looks at the site selection and design activities, the environmental protection, construction methodologies and processes, materials used during construction, energy investment during construction, energy expenses during usage, indoor environmental quality, renewable energy usage, the waste management during construction and during usage, <clears throat> water usage and recycling, operation and maintenance, and finally, innovation and performance enhancements over the life cycle of the building. So all these activities need to be addressed and looked into when we are talking about green construction. And many of these things are part of the construction processes that we follow. The second part is passive cooling. Mr. Murthy spoke quite a lot. I'll be just brief on that. The passive cooling systems are at least our least expensive means of cooling a home, which maximizes the efficiencies of building envelope without any use of mechanical devices. Obviously, if we are able to cool the whole building in a manner that the cooling is not required, artificial cooling is not required, obviously, <clears throat> this, this would be a passive cooling and, and that will be a much, uh, it, it would produce much gains for the whole structure. It relies on natural heat sinks to remove the heat from the building. They derive cooling directly from the evaporation, convection, and radiation without using any intermediate electrical devices. All passive cooling strategies rely on daily changes in temperature and relative humidity, as Mr. Murthy showed us that uh, graph. 
and obviously the planning has to be the local based on the local environment the planning has to be done the applicability of each system depends on the climate conditions prevailing in the area these design strategies reduce heat gains to internal spaces which includes these four items natural ventilation shading wind towers courtyard effects earth air tunnels evaporative cooling passive down draft draft cooling and roof sprays let's go bit further in this the cooling cost over the life cycle of passively designed structure could be reduced substantially if we if we are going for passive cooling main purpose passive cooling design approaches include solar control ventilation for cooling ground cooling evaporative cooling or radiative uh, radiative cooling we have seen the examples from mr murthy's presentation the common cooling systems which generally are employed and uh, they help in passive cooling should be or would be lower shading devices double glazing of openings natural ventilation of building spaces green roofing insulation evaporative cooling via water bodies and fountains indirect radiant cooling light colored reflective painting we have seen examples in mr murthy's presentation the facades of the structure are designed and constructed to help to reduce reducing the heat gain by them the passive design considerations considers local conditions in reducing the heat heating or cooling requirements of the structure exposure to longer duration of sunlight is managed efficiently to reduce the absorption of heat by structures we have seen the examples of india vidar center or others uh, in the mumbai which mr murthy explained the designs support passive evaporative cleaning now the comes point where we are talking about the greenness of any structure this is something where we have to see that the lesser the energy expanded over the life of the structure greener it is a building made of mud could be the greenest whereas a energy guzzling building should be the black one based on the larger extent of energy savings during the entire life cycle which in turn means smaller carbon footprints various structures are graded and each green building grading process awards a grade on a predetermined grading scale to compare the greenness of buildings common green building evaluation processes in practice aim at evaluating the comparative greenness of subject building projects there there are defined grading scale and one building or one structure would be meeting one particular providing one particular positive impact some negative impact the sum total scale will tell whether it's the greenest building or the blackest building this evaluation process defines the grades of greenness of the structure now there are shortcomings in the systems wherein my works do come in uh, the shortcomings in the system are non comprehensive nature of the grading scales most grading systems evaluate the grading expanded during the construction the energy expanded during the construction and usage in the post construction period one of the major parameter missing in such systems is the embodied energy of the materials of construction now embodied energy means the energy which i invest in creating transporting and installing a material in my project <clears throat> and that's the quantum energy spent there in case the material being used has consumed larger extents of energy during manufacturing or transportation process compared to any alternate material its cognizance is absent in those processes if i bring in a thick glass wall for my building naturally the amount of energy i would have spent to melt silica and create glass plates would have been much more than the energy spent in creating let's say brick walls or maybe dry dry brick wall, dry walls so evaluating any building to be green just because it contains a glass facade does not mean that the complete building is green because the major amount of energy is already spent and the quantum of energy which i save by during the usage is much much less than what the anomaly at times makes the situation too obtuse so much so that the energy saved post construction comes out to be a fraction of the total embodied energy invested defeating the whole purpose of entire grading process so what cidc did to address this anomaly 
CIDC established the CIDC Comprehensive Green Rating System, that is CCGR. The system takes embodied energy in materials and inputs into account. Say you are creating a material, uh, you are, let's say you're making brick, you're making glass, it would have a certain embodied energy required. You need to calculate the quantum of embodied energy invested and transporting it to the site and installing it. All these three activities will give you a value of embodied energy that has gone in and that needs to get inside the balance sheet or the energy balance sheet of the building or structure. There are a large extent of various construction materials. To be precise, more than 22, uh, which are used as a standard uh, building components. And CIDC has developed the system for working out the embodied energy values of all such inputs. So that is basically the primary embodied energy value. Then comes in its actual application. Say you are making glass sitting in Delhi or sitting in Bhopal and trying to ship it to Guwahati. There will be a substantial amount of energy spent transport, uh, transporting this. All those put together have, brings you to a secondary level of embodied energy impact. And all that evaluation has been done, or rather that systems have been done by CIDC. While grading a structure with such values are evaluated and the necessary weightages are recorded to arrive at the comprehensive green rating of the structure. These ratings provide true reflection of the greenness of the structures and not the greenness just because the day it, the con construction concluded from that day onwards, you are evaluating the energy spent. Currently, this grading is being done for the structures under Vishwakarma Award, which are going on. We are running the 13th Vishwakarma Award this year. And all the structures which have applied for the Vishwakarma Awards are being graded for greenness. It is intended to launch it commercially from this year, from the CIDC Foundation Day. In addition, CIDC has entered, as all of us are aware, into an understanding with the Ozone Cell Project Management uni uh, Unit, Ministry of Urban and Urban Forest and Climate Change Government of India to promote good management practices for energy efficient buildings by introducing passive cooling design to reduce operational costs, improve health and comfort, and promote use of non SCFC and low GWP alternatives. Part of it is already a part, uh, a substantial amount of this is already a part of the CCGR. And based on the provisions of this MOU, passive cooling parameters are also being promoted in the construction industry. Actions are aimed at implementing the SCFC phase out management plan. That is what is the primary aim of uh, this particular MOU or a, a memorandum of uh, agreement in association with UNEP. Since this gels well with the CCGR, CIDC has initiated the process in tandem with ongoing CCGR process. We have more than uh, some 200 odd different projects where we have been uh, seeking the inputs of the questionnaire about the, uh, this particular uh, process. And we hope that most of the, those uh, applicant projects would be responding and they would be coming in. We also intend to create a Google form for all these, which would be going, going on the net. And I believe the academia and the students could uh, go through those uh, the, uh, the, uh, that particular questionnaire and respond so that we get more responses and a better uh, representation or answers to these questions. In addition, overall stakes, stakeholder sensitization is also being undertaken. And this keynote is a part of the same. So with this, I would like to conclude my statements. We have inherited this land from our ancestors only to live on it. It doesn't belong to us as it is the property of our future generations. We merely are its custodians <clears throat> as we have to turn it over to them with the least degradation. Green building and passive cooling are two important tools at our disposal to achieve this. Let us protect our environment as best as practicable. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Niranjan. It was really very... <clears throat> comprehensive to understand the embodied energy. And I think we have to work on these things. Vishkarma awardees are doing it, but we would like others to also join hands with us in this initiative. Thank you. Once again. Now I'd like to invite Shri Akash Deep, 
who is the senior program manager, Greha Council, which stands for Green Rating for Integrated Habitat Assessment. Shri Akashdi would be speaking on role of ECBC in passive cooling in buildings in India. I welcome Mr. Akashdi. Uh, thank you, CIBC, and thank you, MOEF, CN, and CC, for inviting uh, us on, for delivering this uh, presentation on role of ECBC in passive cooling in built in India, buildings in India. And um, before we go into details of what GRIHA and what we do and how ECBC implementation is a part of GRIHA as a mandate requirement, uh, we'll uh, uh, deep dive into the basic requirement why this discussion is happening basically. Now, when we talk about buildings, uh, I'll start with, with one of the very basic questions which uh, all of us as built environment specialists are aware of basically. So why do we need buildings? That's the very basic question. And if our buildings are able to meet uh, the basic, uh, the very basic uh, requirement. The first question, why do we need buildings? Uh, the answer is very basic and very simple. Uh, uh, that is, it is required to give us comfort. It is required to protect us from climate. Uh, when, is, when we say comfort, the things which we require to achieve, the building is required to achieve. What is our comfort requirement? And if we are not meeting these comfort requirement, the basic necessity of the building is missing, which is the thermal comfort, the visual comfort, the acoustical comfort, and the modern day times issues, that's the indoor air quality. If our building is not giving us these basic four requirements, there's something wrong in the current building design or something wrong in the current building practices. And that's what we are trying to find out. So uh, we will say that we go into energy management because majorly we are targeting ECBC compliance as a one single component, why it is important. Now, when we talk about energy management in a building, our uh, buildings, uh, there's, a, there's a misconception that if I install renewable energy, if I install solar, I'm green, I'm sustainable. And because I'm meeting all of my demands through solar, but that is not the intent of being sustainable. If we are trying to achieve sustainability and energy management, the first and foremost requirement is to reduce our demands. Now, in a building, how do you reduce your demands? Uh, I make sure that my auto lighting is efficient, it has automatic controls, Make sure my design is optimized, my window to wall ratio, my sky like to roof ratio, that is the amount of window openings which I'm giving, that is optimized. As we all know, excess of everything is bad. But nowadays we have excess of glass being used across the building with the uh, environment in which we live in hot and dry climates, we require much of cooling spaces and glass makes sure that the heat is increased. So we have to make sure we optimize the glass usage, the openings in our buildings. Similarly, instead of just pushing towards a high-end glass, we make sure that we have proper shading, which was the original practices, as Sir was mentioning in his presentation, our ancestral houses, our ancestral uh, buildings were always having good shading design, proper opening, and then make sure that the daylight is optimized. And finally, then we go into the artificial lighting requirements. Once we have reduced our demands, so our energy demands is basically lighting, space conditioning, and equipments. So by daylighting integration and uh, proper artificial lighting reduction, we make sure that our lighting demands are reduced. Second, making sure that our thermal uh, masses, the building which we create, the envelope which we create is efficient so that the heat gain is reduced. And then we go into having better instruments which are high efficient. So ECBC compliances with regards to your uh, equipments, HVAC, the lighting controls, all these comes into place. Once we have tried to reduce these demands as much as possible, then we go into supply side management, that is renewable energy systems. If the first step itself is missing, basically. So if the demand reduction is missing, obviously there will be high cost of investment in the supply management, which means that we are not having right, we are not making right choices at right time, basically. So uh, when we talk about energy efficiency in building, there are generally two components into it. One is energy usage, which is your lighting, outdoor lighting, space lighting, space conditioning, and equipments. Now, space conditioning can be both heating or cooling, depending on the place we are located within our country. Majorly heating, majorly cooling, but in some places heating also. Now, ECBC governs all of these, what we are trying to use as equipments to achieve these. The second part of energy efficiency in building comes from the heat gain, which is one of the major component if your building envelope plays a very important role into this. Now, when I talk of building envelope, you have three components, which is walls, 
groups and windows so glass which are we are using now windows can be skylight as well but if these three components are designed as for the local climate is these three components are uh, making sure that the heat transfer is uh, less then you this also get compliance to the ecbc compliance of the building and load further what we achieve through these two ecbc compliance compliance is energy consumption reduction so you have reduced lighting air conditioning and equipment load there is something called epi that is energy performance index which is basically how much energy you are using annually per square meter that is defined by one once i have a heat gain within my building how much air conditioning are required to mitigate that heat gain secondly how much lighting are required after daylighting to make a visually comfortable environment within my building so all of these systems are basically governed by ecbc in a building uh, as we know glass one of the major for and sir also talk about glass excessive use of glass in his previous presentation now when we say about glass or a window in a building why do we have a window in a building again it just serves two basic purposes daylight and ventilation now interestingly in modern day times none of most of the buildings have switched to air conditioning so the windows only usage remaining is daylighting right now the question comes if i have a room which has 100% glass and if i have a room which is kind of older design which have smaller glass to cell level and this also has breaking so after every 2 meters after every 2 meters i have a window which is of 1.5 meters will my daylight area change so one is 100% glass another is windows after every 2 meter interval will my daylight area change actually no my daylight area will not change what will change is the intensity of daylight which which means that there might be an increase in glare also means that there can be increase in heat gain because glass is high specific heat so it is very important that we make sure that we use materials in its limitations and as per the local climates so wwr that is the window to wall ratio ecbc defines that in any climate which you are making a building in india you should not exceed it more than 60% because it doesn't make sense if even if you are increasing it more than 60% you will increase heat gain significantly rather than helping you in daylight at all because it will increase glare as well similarly if anybody is living on the top uh, floor he will be he or she will understand that heat gain from the roof is the maximum so we have a, a architectural feature called skylight which actually uh, is a good way of integrating daylight to spaces where you have light coming in from roof but then when we were having an rcc roof the heat gain was so much and when we shifted it to a skylight which is a glass roof the heat gain increases further so it is important and that's why ecbc also puts a bracket to the skylight which you are providing in your group building which means that it should not be more than 5% because if you increase it more than 5% your heat gain will increase drastically and uh, these uh, skylights are basically defined as closed environment so if you are air conditioning these environment if you are having a naturally uh, ventilated courtyard that's the best thing to have in indian architecture climate basically now Uh, the, this is why this all discussion happened the modern day architecture has somehow uh, gone into aping the west uh, in uh, most of the requirements we want a building which is uh, full of glass and interestingly we all use cars yes we all are car users now car is made of steel glass and plastics your building is such buildings are made of glass excessive glass lots of steel and lots of concrete so uh, a, a more uh, a product which has high specific heat again and uh, when that when i'm parking a car i always look for shading areas yes that's because i'm uh, make sure that my car doesn't become an oven when i'm parking it in open ground area basically but when i'm making a building i'm making a glass building it is going to remain for next 60 years making sure that we make sure that all heat which is around us are taken within the building increasing our heat load increasing our uh, discomfort and increasing our other costs in building it so first we invest in high end glass which is costly second we invest in curtains if you see all of them have curtains none of them is open actually speaking uh, the original use of daylight has gone because of glare component and ill designed uh, shading practices so first you invest in glass then we invest in shadings and then we have uh, huge discomfort happening through glare 
And uh, then what we did was we make sure that the air conditioning is 16 degrees or 18 degrees and having uh, lights on. So the basic intent of the comfort is gone somewhere. Now, what is wrong in the current practices? What is wrong in current practices that the basic, the cost and the time invested in all these processes, the marketing, the construction, operation, maintenance is the highest. The thing which requires the most time and cost is the lowest, that is the design. The design is the solution for all of our problems. If we have a very good design, and that was the uh, slides which uh, Sir also showed in the ancestral architecture which we have in India. So each of our ancestral design was as for the local climate. Kerala had its own climate and its own building design. Rajasthan had its own building design. Uh, Madhya Pradesh had its own building. So each city, each state, the design was such that it answers the climate issues and making sure that we are comfortable. So the change is required in the design. If the design is itself comprehensive, meets the climate requirements, automatically the further time and cost, the cost in construction, the cost in operating, cost in maintenance will reduce automatically. So the design is key. And there's where Griha comes into place. So what is Griha? Griha is basically a tool to measure greenness throughout your life cycle. It measures your uh, sustainability intent during design, during construction, during operation, and during maintenance, basically. Uh, the basic in, uh, principle on which Griha is created is what gets measured, gets managed. And that's not Griha, that's a general principle about Griha, uh, management. If you want to manage anything, you need to measure it. So Griha gives you benchmarking of measuring various inputs which you have created, basically. Uh, Griha has received multiple recognition both nationally and internationally as national rating system in 2007, MNRE. So ECBC was launched in 2007 and Griha was launched in 2005 and since 2005 ECBC is mandated in Griha. So what Griha does is we do not have our own requirements. We bring all codes together, whether it's a planning code, whether it's a water and sustainability code, whether it's a social laws, whether it's pollution laws, whether it's energy laws, whether it's environment laws. Griha brings everything together in one platter. You follow Griha and you are basic compliant with everyone. Now, better your understanding in implementation of all these systems, the better rating you achieve. Now, uh, as I said, you have four stages in our uh, project. Griha evaluates the process. When you talk about sustainability, as rightly said uh, by one of our seniors, uh, that sustainability cannot be given. I want to be sustainable today. I don't want to be sustainable tomorrow. It's a life cycle commitment you are giving. And in a building, the life cycle is design, construction, operation, and maintenance. Why this is important? As I said, if design is wrong, no, nobody can make it right, basically. If design is right, but construction has lots of malpractices, lots of wastages, lots of material wastages, it is unsustainable. Design and constructions are right, but operation maintenance team doesn't know how to operate a building. At the end, you'll have high energy bills, you'll have high water bills, you'll have mismanagement, you'll have discomfort. Again, the building is unsustainable. So it is important. Kriha evaluates your processes rather than the final product. If your process is sustainable, automatically your end product will be sustainable. Uh, these are the various sections which Griha has in general. And just to clarify, uh, and Griha is one of the first rating system across the across the country as uh, and across some parts of the world as well to integrate life cycle costing and life cycle analysis into the whole segment of. Uh, um, rating itself. So life cycle costing and life cycle analysis are basically a holistic evaluation of both embedded energy as well as associated cost to these materials into it. So embedded energy is kind of just associated to embedded energy of the materials, but it does not take care into the costing of that material species. So life cycle costing analysis are new tools which have been added into the rating and this is the first one in across various ratings which we have to have these concepts in the rating evaluation. So if you see whatever you do you in a building, it's planning, it's construction, energy optimization, comfort, water management, solid waste management, materials, life cycle costing, socioeconomics, perform fitting, life cycle of the building and everything which you do is covered in it. Without going to do this, now we have some good examples, two or three good examples, and then we close. Uh, very interesting project, Aksha Urja Bhavan. I'm, I'm hopeful that you are aware of this project. It's in Panchkula. Uh, it's a government of building, a government of uh, Hareda building, which is there. And one of a very interesting passive design buildings in modern day times. Now, when I see this building, I see a glass facade. Oh my God, this is too much of glass. But uh, the interesting thing about this building is, this is a 100% non-AC building. Oh my God, 100% non-AC building. 
how is it possible so uh, just an example so this is the plan of the building and interestingly the glass facade which you saw this was the glass facade now in general a glass facade in indian architecture is given under the northern side so that you have good daylight and less heat uh, but interestingly in this plan if you try to find out north the north is towards the glass facade uh, south is towards the glass facade so this is your south facade you see the sun coming directly on the glass so this is your south facade so this building is designed as a big desert cooler as we said evaporative cooling is one of the very interesting uh, passive technologies which india has and this whole building is designed as a big passive cooler what it does is uh, this glass facade in south uh, it's uh, direct sun make sure that there's lots of heat which is created in the inside of offices what you see these boxes these are called solar chimneys now it has vents or what uh, Uh, ventilators inside the room so what it does is every heat which is generated inside the room gets ventilated through these solar chimneys to the roof which creates a negative pressure basic physics which creates a negative pressure in these areas now what they do is they do something called misting basically every morning on a hot and dry day they do something called water misting in this single courtyard which makes sure that this courtyard becomes cooler in the day and this is heated because of the direct solar radiations Uh, automatically there should be a draft created from the solar courtyard towards these chimneys but what they did was now these have we have these courtyard walls uh, the corridor walls now interestingly if you see the section of the room and this section you have ventilators at the bottom of this wall and you have ventilators on the top of this solar chimneys and which creates an automatic draft to make sure that the whole room is naturally ventilated and that's how this building is cooled there's no air conditioning in this building all uh, throughout 12 hours throughout 12 months that's and interesting if you see the windows so the east and west facade which has the high radiation of sun coming in and huge glare coming in it is made sure that the windows are tilted towards side south side so you have ample daylight but no glare at all and also making sure that all your east and west facades have Uh, services so that your heat gain if there is any in the building as limited to these service areas and it is not coming into your comfort zones so your staircases your toilets your reception areas which are least spaces uses spaces these are being placed on the eastern west facade a very good example so if you see uh, uh, the windows these are the tilted windows on eastern west facade making sure there is glare free daylighting basically in the spaces central courtyard and interestingly another thing about this building is and uh, if we are uh, we all are aware of net zero and net positive in terms of energy it is still possible you put solar you put wind you have biogas and you have net zero but in terms of water it is one of the very biggest challenge in our country and across the world interestingly this building uh, has a very good water management system and this building is a net zero building during rainy season so they don't even uh, import a single drop of water from outside for drinking also during rains a very interesting example but i'll limit my discussion to ecbc only and energy itself probably the next time we uh, meet we have a much more detailed discussion another example that's a residential one this time a smart ghar in uh, rajkot these are affordable houses and um, we have lost somehow one of the most intelligent aspect, uh, aspects of design in residential societies the ventilators were because they help us make sure that even if i am not opening a window which is probably bringing rain inside or huge wind velocities coming in high rise apartment the ventilators are there to help us mitigate our wind flows and make sure we are comfortable if the outside weather is comfortable without acs however what they have done is they have actually Uh, kind of evolved this design itself initially they used to have this uh, regular ventilators which had a problem of mosquitoes or other things coming in and they don't have the option of closing it then they went ahead and uh, used just slider ventilators which is a very good option but then still if the rain is coming in it will still come in uh, finally what they have done is they have a ventilator which is top hung now what happens is this gives you two helps one one you can modulate the wind speed by opening as much as required because if you are living about 10th floor you know I, if I open a window, the wind velocity will be so huge that at times I'll have to close the window and use an AC. I don't have an option of doing it. So the top one ventilator or window gives you two uh, these things. One is you modulate the wind speed. Second is it protects you from the rain as well in a good climate when it's outside and you don't have to switch on AC. 
Another very good example is that they have a forced ducting in the common utility. So forced ventilation, which creates a negative pressure in all the spaces. So what they did is they had a forced ducting on the top. They had a common fan on the top. So that each, and it's an affordable housing. So it becomes very important that in, if I see in uh, this one flat, I need to install two exhaust fans, which is a cost to a user, which is an affordable EWS user. By providing just one fan, I have uh, made sure that in each floor, or around the eight units of exhaust fans are not installed, and made sure that in 12 it is not installed, basically. So small things, small design changes are very important in cost-effective, sustainable practices, both comfort uh, when we are trying to make it sustainable, and it is a very good example from me again, lots of cross-ventilation, courtyard designing, very good project. Uh, it has uh, very uh, uh, good uh, thermal comfort as well as visual comfort as well. So this is the impact which we have created, a very fast track and uh, basic impact. Uh, we are now, the summary is a bit outdated. We are now more than 2,200 projects across India. And uh, this is what we have saved and uh, implemented in terms of 700 and more rated projects, more than 533 megawatt of renewable energy installed, this much of energy saving and this much CO2 turn reduction. Similarly, in terms of water, uh, this is what we have achieved. And this, if we make sure that just this percentage achieves this much and all our footprints are sustainable, how much we all can achieve together, both in achieving Paris Agreement protocols and also our 2070 commitment of carbon neutral country, basically. And that is all. Thank you for listening diligently. What do you mean, ma'am? Thank you, <laughs> Mr. Akashthi. It was really nice to hear the initiatives and things that are feasible in construction today. We look forward for more such buildings to really reduce the energy requirement of our country. And now I would like to invite our next speaker. And I have been asked in the chat box, if you can have the uh, PPTs, I would like to mention you can subscribe to CIDC YouTube and we would be uploading these uh, presentations on the YouTube for everybody's benefit. Thank you. So now I would like to invite Dr. P. Vijay Kumar. He is the professor, Department of Mechanical Engineering, Laki Reddy, by Reddy College of Engineering, and his topic is passive cooling of buildings using phase change materials for thermal comfort and energy saving. I invite you, Dr. P. Vijaya Kumar. Uh, Hello, madam. Yes. Uh, we cannot see you. Uh, video is not. Uh... Can you switch on your video? Would you like to share your presentation? Yes, madam. Yes. Oh, thank you, madam. Yeah. So, as uh, the earlier speakers uh, talked much about uh, different types of methods uh, uh, by which we can uh, have this uh, uh, passive cooling technologies, uh, just for the sake of. Uh, uh, having comfort and uh, saving uh, uh, money also. So therefore, I, I want to present in my talk uh, a small uh, case study in which uh, uh, as uh, there are so many methods, but uh, what I'm going to present is uh, I'm using one uh, material called as face and material. So it is used in the passive cooling uh, methods, which is very effective. Uh, in capturing the solar energy that is falling on a building and it is going to store the heat uh, for a longer period of time and it is not allowing the heat to go inside and therefore it is not going to create any uh, problem or uh, uh, that means uh, the people who are residing inside the uh, house may not be affecting the, the solar energy or uh, there there will not be any problem with the uh, excess heat that is coming inside the room. So therefore, uh, the intention of this uh, small uh, case study is to present, there is a effective method, uh, passive cooling method in which a patient material is used as a main important one. And uh, how this is being used, uh, I will show you in my presentation. 
uh, a small building is being taken uh, a small uh, uh, you see this one this is the actually uh, the design small design uh, you can see the concrete slab rcc here then uh, above this one a one inch uh, panel is being placed here over it okay in which uh, in this panel a pcm metal is filled so i have taken uh, a one inch size uh, galvanized panel in which the piece of metal is being filled and over which there is a rooftop slab also uh, with uh, 10 centimeters uh, thickness and the uh, actual roof uh, concrete slab is having 12 centimeter thickness okay, this, this is my uh, piece of integrated roof actually this is a rcc roof what you can see here having 12 centimeter thickness okay so therefore with this rcc roof ordinary simple rcc roof and this pcm integrated roof how this is going to be uh, play a major role in uh, uh, keeping the temperatures down uh, for a long period of time and how this is going to create some comfort uh, conditions inside the room for the uh, people who are residing okay? now this is actual picture so this is a 3d model of the same pcm integrated roof uh, how you see here the building roof is being uh, okay uh, directly exposed to the sun radiation and how the radiation is coming onto the roof and uh, it is being uh, therefore the direction of india i have shown here and this is for this model and this model is being compared with the uh, simple uh, rcc roof okay now i will show you how this is going to work out and the material what i selected is uh, uh, PCM CaCl to 6H2O that is calcium chloride six, uh, hexahydrate. Okay? These are the properties you can see and the properties of concrete slab RCC you can see here density, okay, thermal conductivity, specific heat. Okay? So, therefore, uh, I will show you quickly. And these are the important properties here the face and material temperature, which is at which it is going to melt, is 29 degrees centigrade. So, it is much. Uh, uh, in the comfort temperature range, actually the comfort temperature range, what they suggest is 22 degrees to some 35 degrees. Okay, so it is well within the within that range. Therefore, the solar radiation which is falling on the rooftop is being completely received by this facial material. Actually, facial material is nothing but it would be changing its phase from one form to other form. Actually, it will be in the solid form initially. So, as the solar radiation is received or captured by this uh, or absorbed by this facing metal, it just turns into liquid form. Okay. So, uh, as it is uh, melting at this 29 degrees temperature, the entire amount of heat that uh, is being stored by this piece of metal itself inside the roof that is in the middle part, as I shown you. Okay? Therefore, it won't allow the heat to go inside the room. Uh, ultimately, what we get is nothing but uh, temperature rise will not be there, and uh, therefore we can maintain the inside room conditions uh, at uh, comfort temperatures for a longer period of time. Okay, that is the intention. Now, these are some of the properties of this uh, selected piece of material, and moreover, you can see here it is having a very large specific heat. You can see, okay, one lakh twenty-five thousand. That is in this temperature range, 29 degrees to 30 degrees temperature. Okay? Therefore, because of this large specific heat is going to help a, a lot in uh, uh, storing large or bulk amount of heat, okay, huge amount of heat that can uh, store by the uh, facing material. Okay? Now, I will show you the uh, what are the results here with the ordinary roof, and uh, these are the Models that are uh, done uh, using ANSYS. Okay, this is simple RCC roof and this is a PCM integrated roof. For this, the data taken is the solar uh, uh, radiation data for the selected area. So now, as you can see in this graph, the radiation is uh, how it is increasing only during part of the day here. So that uh, heat flux you can see. Yeah, that is a major cause of rising the temperatures on the uh, building walls and roof. Then uh, I have constructed two uh, small uh, 
uh, experimental test rooms. Uh, left hand side, this is without PCM, and right hand side, this is with PCM. So on the RCC slab, I have kept one uh, inch uh, galvanized, uh, galvanized iron panel in which PCM was filled, and therefore uh, on that uh, on that uh, panel. Uh, there is one rooftop also you can see here so therefore the pcm is in between the rooftop slab as well as uh, rcc slab okay so the intention is here whatever the amount of uh, solar energy that is falling on this rooftop is directly being uh, will be trying to go penetrate through this uh, rooftop then it comes to the middle part or middle layer that is nothing but pcm panel so where uh, once it comes to the middle part the entire solar radiation is being absorbed there and the pcm melts uh, that means it is converting from solid to liquid. Then it stores the uh, entire amount of heat. And therefore, uh, literally it won't allow any kind of uh, energy to pass through this RCC panel. Therefore, in that case, there is no question of uh, uh, entering any excess amount of heat uh, uh, through the RCC panel into the room. Okay? So the, therefore, how this, uh, uh, there are some, uh, Measuring devices, digital indicator uh, with thermocouples, which are uh, connected okay, at different places of the PCM indicator roof to measure the temperatures okay, throughout the day. Then these are the simulation results in ANSYS. You can see for the ordinary RCC roof, you can see the 38.21 degrees centigrade. Okay, this is the temperature. Now, if you look at the uh, PCM roof temperature, it is uh, still higher than this. Uh, uh, RCC roof, okay, 42.449 on the top. But if you look at the temperatures inside, these are the graphs you can see. So for RCC roof uh, in the month of May, okay, this is the trend of the graph. You can see temperature variation, and this is fluctuating like this, as you can see from the uh, okay, uh, this uh, pink color, okay. Uh, symbol you can see uh, curve and whereas this one this blue color line is nothing but the ambient temperature and the other uh, are uh, other lines are not nothing but showing the okay, temperature variation of the roof top slab the okay, rooftop as well as uh, roof bottom then if you come to the pcm uh, uh, integrated roof you can see here the temperatures are almost uh, maintained constant you can see okay this pink color line is straight whereas in the other case left hand side is fluctuating like this okay therefore the ability of the pcm to okay capture store the huge amount of uh, heat uh, within itself okay therefore that is possible here therefore so even though the ambient temperatures are uh, higher here you can see this uh, blue color uh, curve but even then the room is maintaining constant temperatures okay so the temperatures have been uh, uh, recorded for uh, different months may okay january february okay march okay so for all the months you can see in the pcm integrated roof you can see the same trend okay even though the ambient temperatures are different okay and the roof temperatures are different but the PCM panel is maintaining the, our uh, roof bottom is having uh, this uh, constant temperatures, okay? Then you can see the variation in the uh, RCC roof and, okay, uh, integrated. Okay. Then another curve we can see, uh, the comparison of uh, simulation results of PCM uh, integrated roof as well as the ordinary, okay? Uh, Simple RCC roof. Okay, so this is simple RCC roof. This is experimental PCM. This is simulated PCM. Uh, you can see the variation. Okay, so therefore you can see, even though it is having uh, very close to uh, the simulated ceiling uh, temperature, but it is having, uh, that means the night temperatures will be low and the daytime temperatures will be higher. Therefore, it is nullifying the overall temperature difference. Therefore, the it is just uh, uh, 
throwing the advantages of okay using the pc material in the uh, buildings for uh, cooling uh, thermal comfort okay and you can see the rooftop is having this uh, temperature variation like this okay but whereas the roof pcm panel and rc ceiling now you can see here there are three layers i, I told you know the top layer is having this fluctuations temperature is fluctuation like this but whereas coming to the pcm panel and the uh, rc ceiling which is uh, below this pcm panel is having no effect of solar radiation okay so this is being recorded for all the uh, 24 hours uh, time and you can see the rc slab is having this uh, fluctuations like this whereas the so this is also rcs roof in another month okay so you can see that temperatures are almost going uh, touching uh, are going beyond 50 degrees also okay at some what is the time at 12 o'clock okay so but this is not the problem here you, now you can see here in the pcm room these are the temperature gradients you can see then this is heat transfer in pcm room and this is in the month of march okay pcm room then if we compare both uh, rcc and uh, pcm the heat flux that is entering into the pcm room is you can see how much it is less than this one rc zero okay and uh, moreover the uh, the in different months uh, uh, i'm showing here this is for january this is for uh, march okay it is still lower here okay then then these are some of the graphs which are showing the uh melting fraction of the okay uh, pc material so as the uh larger the size of the okay pc capsule okay melting time is less and as the uh pc capsule temp uh, radius is uh, that is uh, thickness is uh, 20 mm you can see how much time it is taking then these are the effective reflected coatings on the incident uh, okay solar flux uh, this is another method so therefore uh, this is one of the idea uh, to modify the roof structure with this uh, new one okay where we are keeping the uh, pcm panel here okay then uh, providing some air gap uh, in between therefore uh, as you know very well the air is a poor conductor of heat uh, So therefore, water water amount of solar radiation that is falling on this uh, uh, roof structure uh, as uh, solar reflective coatings uh, have been applied here, so part of the radiation goes out uh, initially, and uh, the remaining heat will be just absorbed by this PC material, and absolutely we are just uh, not allowing any kind of radiation okay, heat to go uh, to the bottom layer, which is nothing but the RCC roof. Okay, so anyway, air is a poor heat conductor, therefore. Uh, that is the intention of uh, providing the same gap here in between case so this is a, a small presentation okay so that's all so that means here i am just uh, giving some few points here so this is uh, suitable for the climatic conditions where the temperatures will not exceed 40 degrees in summer okay uh, because in the most of the parts of india uh, require uh, cooling not the heating okay only few parts of india may be requiring cooling uh, requiring heating okay so therefore uh, if you develop this one further we can have this uh, uh, that means uh, we can say the uh, energy consumption as well that means uh, how we can say energy consumption we can say means uh, we can just uh, drastically reduce the Uh, use of uh, acs okay therefore you can uh, reduce uh, power bills that is one way secondly thermal comfort as we are maintaining the comfort temperatures within the uh, so uh, okay uh, comfort temperature range uh, that is 22 to 35 degrees okay therefore 
if you select a material which is uh, having uh, even less than 29 degrees melting point therefore uh, you can have uh, better uh, uh, inside temperatures okay that that means uh, if you select a 22 degrees uh, uh, pc melting temperature then uh, you can better okay maintain 22 or 23 maximum okay temperature uh, possibility is there therefore it is more uh, convenient okay and therefore it is uh, uh, giving more comfort uh, uh, temperature conditions inside the room okay then so actually this is uh, following this uh, uh, latent heat uh, uh, technology actually so our in uh, our uh, Old, in olden days, uh, the sensible cooling techniques were used for so many decades. Okay? Therefore, whenever this uh, latent heat uh, thermal energy storage technology has come, and um, uh, most probably this uh, PC material has been introduced, uh, from then onwards, we can see the drastic change in the uh, passive cooling technologies. Uh, okay? um, they are, these are more uh, uh, convincing and more, uh, uh, what we call, um, more promising, I can say. Okay, so therefore, uh, these are being widely used uh, throughout the world. Uh, the PC metal is being used uh, not only on the rooftop; uh, it can be placed in the walls also. Okay? And different uh, uh, roof structures have been uh, designed, and uh, uh, roof structures have been okay uh, tested by uh, so many researchers uh, across uh, the world. Okay, so so many, so much of uh, work is uh, being. Uh, going on throughout the world by so many uh, experts and researchers. Okay? Therefore, uh, I want to conclude with this uh, small uh, uh, case study. Thank you, madam. Thank you, Dr. Vijay Kumar. Indeed, we look forward to having such research being done on the construction sites as well to have real impact. There are some questions in the chat box. A few of you want to know about the next program. We will be sharing the details as we did this time, sending emails to all. And those who would like to join us may write to us at CIDCFBD at gmail.com. It's all there in the letter that we have sent you. And you can also we will be informing, it will be on our website. You can visit our website, cidc.in and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We will be uploading this present, all these uh, presentations on the channel. Okay, thank you. And now I'd like to invite Dr. Ruchi Shirvasta, who is the principal, Paral Institute of Engineering and Technology, Baroda. Dr. Ruchi Shirvasta would be speaking on Restore Earth. Thank you. I would like to invite Dr. Ruchi Shivasta to Kandi. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. So, uh, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to present uh, on this platform. Myself, Dr. Ruchi Shivasta, and I'm working as principal at Parul Institute of Engineering Technology Diploma Studies. I am going to give presentation on restored earth. Mother Earth is highly worth, so plant trees make garden and prove that you care for the Mother Earth. The flow of presentation includes introduction, natural disasters or processes, case studies I have considered because till now we have just gone through the technical part, natural forest, urban forest, emerging green technologies, innovative thinking of students of our university and the main focus for India's country specific campaigns. So to restore our earth, we should mainly focus on the natural processes, emerging green technologies, and innovative thinking that can restore the world's ecosystem. We all are aware about the natural calamities. So the calamities can also be converted in form of boon by certain uh, processes that we can follow. So my first case study is on the natural process, which was basically carried out by a uh, layman called as Jadav Pain. He is also called as the India's forest man. And uh, he is an environmental activist and a forest worker from Majuli. And he has uh, like planted 
thousands of trees and converted the barren land into a forest on the river Brahmaputra. And at present in his particular forest, we can see around 120 species of birds, including migratory ones and elephants, rhinos and tigers visiting from Kazidanga National Park. So he has converted the total barren land into a forest. And we can also observe around 50 to 150 elephants remaining in the forest for nearly three months in a year. He has a simple solution to the global problem of depleting forest cover. He focuses or stresses on teach our children to love nature. The rest will happen on its own, he feels. He is also afraid about his forest safety and he knows it will be survived. The another case study that I have taken from the Barodra, that is urban forest. This urban forest is developed at Barodra city at Rajiv Nagar under the guidance of members of Rotary Club of Baroda Greens, of which I am also one of the member. The administrative head is Barodra Management uh, Seva Sadan, and the funding partners are Rajkamal Builders. So basically, uh, the plantation was done on 14th Feb 2021, and the height of the most of the trees are more than six feet. It has been developed by the Miyawaki system. The Miyawaki system is basically uh, founded by Japanese botanist Akira Miyawaki in 1980s. It is comprising of four compressed layers of uh, shrubs, trees, canopies on a small plot of land, turning them into a tiny forest. So what we have done is that in this particular project, we can see that almost uh, we have done the soil survey. What are the nutrients on the survey? After doing the soil survey, we have done the mixing of the soil with the nutrients, which I've already mentioned that it is uh, soil coir with dry cow dunk or goat droppings and dry cell in the proportion of one is to one is to one is to one. And this proportion of uh, the mixture is then prepared, then placed in a particular pit of one by one square meter where only four plants can be, uh, 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 we can grow only four plants. And this particular soil nutrient is then uh, given into the roots so that the growth of the tree or the plant is very faster. So we can see that in this particular barren land, which was plotted in uh, 14th Feb 2021 and planted by Miyawaki system today, after 10 months, it is giving us the forest with six feet growth of the trees. So the method involves planting two to four trees per square meter. And this is what we have done in our Baroda city where we have created this urban forest. The other uh, uh, parameter that I've taken into consideration that is about the emerging green technology where we are focusing on recycling bin, passive design in green buildings that we have heard since morning solar panels, smart thermostat and rain barrels. The figure itself shows that we have got uh, certain particular uh, recycling bins or solar panels which are uh, trying to save energy. We have got uh, wind uh, channels which are trying to uh, produce energy. So the six R's that we have to consider for the sustainable environment is rethink, that is step back and think about the type of consumer you want to be, then refuse, that is think before you buy and try to go for minimum purchase or less purchase, reduce, that is buy less, buy products that have little or no packaging, long time borrow instead to buy and compost, refuse, upcycle instead of throw away, repair, try to fix items before disposing of them and recycle, that is compost, right? So these are the six R's that we have to consider and follow so that we can sustain our earth. Now, all these things that I've talked and we have heard about rainwater harvesting. So I've taken a particular building and the reference is from www.eia.in. So if we talk about, first of all, the orientation of the home. So the orientation of the home or residential building should be such that we can harness sun and we can use the energy of sun and shield it from the heat. Apart from that, it should be fully ventilated. 
uh, being a civil engineer, when we are studying the building uh, services or building designing, always it has been a question that we have to provide our kitchen in east direction so that the first sun rays enter our uh, kitchen, right? Similarly, our orientation of the buildings should be such that we can maximum use the energy of the sun and the wind uh, so that it is fully ventilated uh, naturally. If we talk about our living room, so we can see that the living room, we, use, we can go for using the CFLs, which will uh, give 20% less energy than the incandescent bulbs. If we took, talk about the washrooms, then dual flush toilets should be used, which helps conserve water with controlled water outlets. High efficiency insulated glass windows reduce energy use. Motion detectors can be used to switch off lights if there is no one in the room. Energy efficient appliances reduce power use. Also, the gray water from the bath, sink, kitchen, and the washing areas to, uh, can be used for flushing the laboratories. Apart from that, we can use that particular uh, gray water and treat it uh, till it uh, reaches the CP uh, control of uh, pollution control board. Uh, norms and we can use it for uh, the gardening purpose. Then we have heard about the rainwater harvesting in our very first lecture. So that rainwater harvesting system on the roof can collect water to be used to flush toilets. It can also be used for the gardening purpose. Then we can also go for the composting part. So we can try to make our building green. That is, we can use less amount of uh, uh, the outer sources and we can have environmental friendly building. So I have considered one case study on CII Sohrabji Godrej Green Business Center, which is in Hyderabad and the first green building. It is a perfect blend of India's rich architectural splendor and technological innovation in incorporating traditional concepts into modern and contemporary architecture. So in this particular building, we have observed that they have used solar PV system, indoor air quality monitoring, high frequency uh, HVAC system, uh, passive cooling system, high performance glasses, aesthetic roof gardens, rainwater harvesting and root zone treatment system. So basically this was a building or the first building which was inaugurated by Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam uh, in July 2004 in Hyderabad. Uh, at the time it was the first building in the world outside the US to be awarded as the platinum rating under the LEED rating system making it the greenest building in the world. The most environmental friendly building and it was uh, basically uh, constructed with the help of architect Karan Grover from Ahmedabad and presently residing in Baroda. And it has a unique public private partnership as a demonstration building for the industry in India and other countries in the world. So the building has got 80% of the material which is used in the construction of the building was recycled, which includes fly ash, a waste material coming out of the cement and other industries. The building discharges zero water as all of its used water is recycled, has a huge capacity for the collection of rainwater. A waterless urinal in which the chemicals are used to store and recycle urine without odor. The building is also highly energy efficient and uses 55% less energy than the conventional building. The intake of natural light is high and there is no need for external lighting. There are two air conditioning towers. I have shown the figures in which the incoming air is cooled to 7 to 8 degree by spraying of the water. The 60% of the roof of the building is covered by the roof garden and the balanced portion of the roof is covered by solar photovoltaic with 24 kW capacity. So these are the glimpses of the central courtyard which facilitates natural ventilation in the whole building. Then jali or perforated walls which brings in the natural light as well as ventilation. You can see that the whole uh, the rooftop is covered with solar panels which saves electricity. The ceramic chips decorates the pillars at the Shorabji Godrej Green Business Center and they reflect the light back. Then wind towers pre-cools in the fresh air entering the air. Handling units and towers are integrated with AHUs. We can see that at the roof, photovoltaic generate electricity. Also, 
for the working system passive daylight scheme provides glazing at task level and above for overall lighting at the godraj green uh, business center in india over here we can see that the north light windows are designed in such a way that it brings in the daylight without heat in india this is basically the photo uh, voltaic generated uh, electricity and we can see over here that the artificial pond is uh, uh, created here we have wind towers the two wind towers that we have talked about which reduces the temperature to around 7 to 8 degree then roots on water treatment facilities provided in a natural way of treating black and gray water at the godrej green business center in india now uh, i have taken two case studies uh, of my students of parul university and uh, they have uh, prepared an innovative project of power gym that is uh, they have used this particular uh, machine in which uh, we try to walk and when we are trying to walk we are um, uh, uh, using the energy generated through the uh, uh, walk path and that energy is stored and it can be used in the form of um the uh, solar panels and the lights similarly another innovative thinking of the student of uh, parul university is smart uh, smart waste management system where the whole waste is segregated into three parts with the help of sensors and then the uh, uh, solid waste can be shredded and disposed of the liquid or the gray waste can be uh, converted in form of a compost so uh, this is going to be implemented in the vmc of vadodara uh the third part of that i have covered is about the india's country specific campaigns first campaign is trees for earth where we are inspiring of planting of 7.8 billion trees by 2022 for one person on the earth second campaign is carried out by the government as global climate literacy Uh, leading to swift step where education is uh, very crucial and for students we can try to impart them the knowledge and skills and attitude which requires for uh, preventing the change in the sustainability the third is the end plastic pollution where we need to reduce plastic use much of this is not collected and generally the municipal corporation to have low micron plastic bags are banned so say no to the plastic bag was the biggest campaign that has been carried all over india then protecting endangered species from extinction and earth rise for the climate change coming together to solve climate change related issues perhaps the greatest challenges humanity has ever faced so these are some of the campaigns that have been carried out by government of india and not to mention our biggest a uh, challenge that is swachhta pakwada that we are uh, carrying out in each and every college university so that the students or today's generation is made about made aware about how we can manage or try to go for the green building so without taking much of the time i end my presentation with a very small quote your mind is a garden your thoughts are the seeds you can grow flowers or you can grow weeds Thank you, thank you, dear ma'am. Thank you, thank you, Dr. <coughs> Ruchi Shivasto. Really nice. We do have to make this change of greening our planet to really restore the earth. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. And now uh, we have with us Mr. Abhilash Biel. Mr. Abhilash is working as the green building engineer. in eco 360 holistic sustainable solutions and his topic is net zero energy buildings mr abhilash i would like to invite you to give your presentation thank you for the uh, brief introduction ma'am yeah, i am abhilash bl assistant professor in department of civil engineering with jawar bhatta college of engineering mysore today i am going to talk on a net zero energy building where there is a huge difference between the net zero energy as well as zero energy building yeah moving further here are some of the keywords today i am concentrating on a particular talk that is ecological imbalance sustainability engineering aspect construction sector materials and net zero energy building 
and some of the few case studies and products which we have developed. I'm going to show this in particular detail. Going further, before starting with this, we need to understand what do you mean by sustainable development? As we, we are talking from the previous uh, 11.30, we are saw regarding different aspects of sustainable development. What is the of different sustainability? If we check with the three pillars of sustainability, that is environmental aspects, societal aspects, and economical development, we can observe oh, the sustainability is. as well as the strong sustainability. Further, we can concentrate on these particular weak sustainability as well as the strong sustainability, where we can identify the environmental and the societal aspect of a particular economic development. How the economic has been submerged in the environment and the society. Here, in the weak sustainability, we can observe the economy plays a major role. That is the financial aspect. Similarly, in the strong sustainability, we can see the environmental part plays a major role. Moving further, here I am categorizing the building construction into two different sectors. That is a conventional building with respect to the top green buildings. That comes where the conventional buildings where we know the four different stages, planning, execution, operation, maintenance, and at the last is demolition phase. This is how the life cycle is carried out once we consider with respect to the top conventional buildings. Here we can observe the same flow chart, the same phases of a building takes place, but it in the interaction with the environmental as well as the climatic factors. And if we check with the different rating systems, that is Indian Green Building Council, Griha, LEED, all the rating systems are based majorly on the five different aspects, which is called as Panchabhutas, where it will deal with the Prithvi, Jal, Agni, Vayu, Akash, which is called as Earth, Water, Fire, Air, Space, where when we are working with this, the green building rating systems of a metro, where we deal with all these different aspects. Sustain, it might be the sustainable site, it might be the water efficiency, it might be the energy efficiency, materials, and the indoor environmental quality as well as indoor air quality. Yes, some of the basic buildings, that is green buildings, which are performing very well in terms of the green rating systems are some of the CIA Godre GBC, where we have seen in the previous case studies, where the MAM gave the case studies of the CIA Godre Green Building Council and ITC Green Center, Wipro, and some of the different aspects of the buildings where we come to know the typical payback period. That is what the buyback period. Once we implement the green ratings, things like passive cooling technologies, implementation, implementation of solar panels, implementation of rainwater harvesting, all these can be taken back within some amount of years. That is what we call as typical payback and some of the design where we need to start integrating the overall design, which is also called as figure of merit in the terms of materials, in the terms of embodied energy and in the terms of embodied carbon. Initially, the Director General P. R. Swarupji spoke regarding the embodied energy of the material. Yes, it's very important to understand the cradle to cradle, cradle to gate and the cradle to grave part of an individual material. This is how the embodied energy as well as embodied carbon is identified. Coming to the top zero energy as well as energy zero building. Yes, I was talking regarding the huge difference between these two type of a wordings. Energy zero, the building which doesn't utilize any types of energy. Where zero energy building, which doesn't consume the energy from the external factor. This is what it is termed as zero energy versus energy zero building. Yes, we were discussing with the regarding the passive, cool, uh, passive cooling technologies as the title itself is reducing or non-utilizing of HCFC, that is chlorofluorocarbons in order to reduce the depletion of the ozone, right? Once we come into the picture, we will come to know regarding the solar reflective index. This is one of the case study which I have done. That is the police housing board, which is situated in Bangalore. It is the housing board where it was constructed just in the 17 days, which got the platinum rated from IGBC. This is what the solar reflective index, how it reflects back the heat, which is coming on the particular roof. 
in the same manner we need to consider for the wall as well as for the roof as well as for the flooring material some of the major aspects of the energy conservation which we consider as a passive cooling design structural insulated panels which is called as sips energy efficient lighting system renewable energy like solar and geothermal aspects a home for a benefit from the reduced energy consumption or qualify as a net zero energy home these are the major aspects which we concentrate on energy conservation as uh, some of the pics which we show in order to go with the energy conservation some of the basic examples here is some of the pics from the roller stock of a chennai metro where we know we have traveled in the underground as well as in the elevated once we enter the underground we require huge amount of energy that is through the lighting systems right once we get back to the elevated that is after we uh, once we get back to the ground that is elevated metro station the same lighting should be turned off similarly there was some integrated solutions that is sensors which were adopted where 100% lighting 75% lighting and 50% lighting used to turn on and turn off automatically these were the systems which are adopted in the roller stock similarly the lighting systems in the concourse level platform level and intermediate levels all the different led systems and the lighting systems was controlled through the scada system scada represent the supervisory control and data acquisition systems where it was consisting of different aspects of lighting air vent heating ventilation and air condition system all these were handled we are coming to the top platforms we can see the two different picks one is with respect to the top platform screen doors which was adopted in the underground station and another metro station where the platform screen doors was not implemented here the platform screen doors plays a major role in maintaining the ahu that is what we call as air handling unit once the roller stock come in and moves out of the particular station it will carry huge amount of air along with the roller stock in order to again regain its original air in the particular platform enormous amount of electricity and compressor for the hvac systems was utilizing more hence once the implementation of psd reduced the huge amount of financial aspect in terms of generation of air conditioning part this is how the small changes in implementing of some of the technology will leads to huge amount of changes and coming to the top passive architecture many of the case studies we have undergone some of the things which we have implemented one of the case study like uh, igp police bhavan in gulbarga in karnataka they have implemented this passive downdraft cooling towers where it is around g plus 3 floors where in the gulbarga is completely hot and dry zone of india in karnataka where we can observe around 42 degrees celsius where in the particular summer season we observed there was around 8 degree drop while implementing such type of thing other than this passive down ground off the wall construction was with respect to the top rat trap wall where the foam material was added in that wall this is how we need to understand the overall aspect of conventional method of construction with respect to the top passive architecture and we we used to see the different ancient type of architecture that is what you called as totiva in kannada which gives a central space atrium in the space between our residences which gives a good daylighting factor as well as ventilation for our utility space and some of the different orientation which you can observe like h shape circle shape u shape w shape all these gives the different orientation towards a good daylighting factor as well as eating ventilation and air conditioning thing and some of the project which we took under the initiative of the students project and we prepared such type of models using the terracotta while we understood how the shapes of a particular thing should be done whether it should be a frustrum of a cone whether it should be a complete circle or it should be a cylindrical manner based on the study we understood how this particular terracotta model should be done and we saw the huge amount of temperature drop in the corridor of an institute in a bangalore this is one of the simple model and going further not only implementing the passive cooling technologies in our buildings and 
we need to turn the conventional method of materials into some of the green materials where we understood thermal properties of the different types of concrete blocks sheets that is gi sheets like that we understood and start started the project on this particular blocks which is called as stabilized mud block as well as compressed stabilized earth blocks cscb or smb where we replaced some amount of soil with respect to that of agricultural waste we understood that physical property of a agricultural products will be having thermally sound and thermally good is some of the buildings which were constructed with the different stabilized mud block or laterite blocks or naturally available blocks and further going to that study we took the different agricultural waste like sugarcane bagas rice husk and maize coffee husk and sunflower stalk these are some of the basic materials which we took in our locally available areas in order to understand how this particular material will work with respect to the top building product either it might be the blocks either it might be the cladding material or sockets like that we took that and we tested and we got a good results initially we tested for only the corn cob material and which was tested in drdo and which we got a good results in thermal parameters but duration of the time if we can if we keep the particular corn cob to the duration of a years it will degrade in order to go with some treatment then we can utilize that particular corn cob and some of the different aspects like sunflower stalk mazes coconut shell and coffee husk some of the data which we have got in the different aspects that is compression strength with comparing with respect to that of different conventional thing some of the test we carried out after manufacturing the blocks and some of the test we did in terry delhi where we conducted the temperature regular temperature we kept the regular temperature and the thermal conductivity of the material thermal diffusivity and specific heat capacity of a overall aspect of the particular material was identified and we have compared with respect to the different agricultural waste and for a just for a trial purpose we added all these waste that is a completely composition of all the waste and just we identified so what it was near to the top coffee husk as well as sugar cane which was sufficient for the construction of a block similarly we tested it for a month together in order to check the thermal transmittance how much amount of temperature one is there outside and the temperature two it will transmits to the interior part portion these were the some of the result sheet we obtained during the testing process and comparison with respect to that of initial that is the external temperature which was exposed to the atmosphere and the internal temperature where the thermocouples was used how much amount of the temperature drop we identified for different types of materials this is for the maize this is for the coconut shells and the coffee husk and at the last overall temperature differentials you can observe in this particular thing by this i will conclude by the saying that environment is not your ancestor property in order to utilize however it is we have borrowed this from our children's and we need to return it back as it is thank you old thank, thank, thank you mr abilash it's very nice we have to do continuous research to identify new methods and new material too and we can certainly find out the embodied energy and then work on those things it would be very nice if we can commercially use them thank you very much so now i would like to invite dr suru and mr singh for taking the question answers and their concluding remarks dr suru uh, anybody who wants to have a question can raise their hands and then we will ask the specific author good afternoon madam yes mr seva kumar seva kumar yes yeah. yeah, sure. we provide a certificate yes we would be providing a participation certificate okay thank you ma'am very nice presentation thank you and uh, thank you, we look forward to have this implemented by the industry thank you ma'am yes thank you
Anybody would like to have a question or can I invite Dr. Suru for his closing remarks? I would like to thank all for the compliments that we are receiving. Hello. Hello. Am I ready? Hello. Yes. Yeah, am I audible, please? Yes, you are, but please be a little louder. Okay. Uh, this is a very, very interesting uh, program and very useful. Very, very useful. And this is going to be a very highly technical thing also. Now, how to create skilled uh, technicians who should be technically trained in different aspects of this construction and energy efficient buildings, how to create. Different... Thank you. I would like to. This question is very relevant to CIDC. Yeah, and how will uh, CIDC help in creating this type of uh, skills through training institutes? We have uh, a training program. We have started workers' training program right from 1998. And uh, we are training workers all over the country. We have our own centers and anybody who wants to have their workers trained, they can approach CIDC. You can visit our website and I've given our email CIDCFBD1 at gmail.com. And also in case you want to have, in, we do internship, we are training, doing training programs at all levels. And we are very uh, glad to tell you that with CPWD, the biggest organi government organization of construction, has maintained 40% of trained, tested, certified workers to be used. And CIDC has been the pioneer in doing these things for workers' training. So there is no issue. We'll be glad to do whatever you want. You can join us, join hands with us, so that we have better professionals at the ground. Thank you. Ma'am, can I, uh, can I reply in this print? Sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, uh, we are from Rotary Club of Baroda Greens, and we are preparing a MOOC course uh, for the same, uh, so that uh, we can uh, share it with uh, the teachers, because teachers are the main pioneers who can transform this information to the students. So we'll be uh, training first uh, 50 teachers, from different schools of Barodra. And after that, those teachers will be trying to teach the students. And then from that, we are going to identify only 15 to 20 students. And then we are going to take them to uh, Orbindo for their training at uh, Pondicherry. So this is our uh, roadmap currently for uh, uh, sustainable environment. And definitely we are going to take help from you now. Sure. We have our training centers all over the country because we are part of the planning commission. So we have to take care of that. Thank you. Anybody else who would like to say something? Uh, actually, I also want to say, uh, based on the last discussion with B, uh, we also conducting uh, some training program for ECBC norms. I think anybody is interested, they may contact them also. Thank you. Hello. Yes, Mr. Sanjeev Kumar. Yeah. Good afternoon, madam. Mm -hmm. uh, myself, uh, Sanjeev from Haldoni, Uttaranchal. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have been uh, continuously attending various seminars and webinars on this uh, concern, like ECBC, green building, structural, and uh, I have been very impressed. The panelists are taken uh, such a efforts and making their uh, webinars to a great extent. But what I feel sometimes is that uh, 
if we talk to the research bases and uh, on to the study bases, it is very effective, seems to me. But when I think to be uh, regulated on the actual site, uh, we sometimes find very difficult. Uh, my question is how we should implement such aspects to the practically on the site so that the owner, the builder, and even the uh, person who is making such buildings should be well aware of the benef benefits of such inventions. But it's uh, really difficult because I have been practiced for the last 30 years and uh, I am very keen to implement such new things. Uh, but literally sometimes to key, everybody is very much uh, happy with the things which are going on. Nobody wants to shift for a new concept. There's no doubt whatever the panelist has gone through, it's a very really and a helpful concept. But when I go to the actual site, I find it very difficult. So I need your suggestions that how we should yeah. go ahead. Either should be done from uh, some authorities Dr. to Kumar, Dr. Kumar, Kumar, Dr. Kumar, Kumar. would you like to respond? Yeah, I think uh, I would be responding on this. And uh, uh, you see this deliberation about uh, green buildings and about conservation of energy, carbon footprints, this has been going on for quite some time. There are a number of protocols that have been signed. But unfortunately, and very correctly, as you have mentioned, this has not actually percolated to the ground level. Now, these series of workshops that we are basically organizing, and many more, are going to be held to make sure that the people who are there actually executing the works at site, they are sensitized. And this is where CIDC fortunately has a very, very uh, wide network, and the biggest network possibly in the country, where we keep our fingers on almost all the projects that go uh, in the country for that matter. Now, about two years ago, having completed the compendium, you know, uh, to, to make assessment of the uh, embodied energy and uh, things like that, uh, we basically went into uh, making some kind of uh, regular awareness amongst the industry constituents. And the easiest method that we chose was that there is an annual award ceremony that we celebrate. And it is actually the good organizations who are actually recognized for their skills. Now, while we were doing that, so two years ago, we started uh, basically taking a stock as to which are the kind of processes and systems that they are following and adopting. And then wherever we found that there is a scope of improvement, that actually was advice to them. And I'm happy to tell you that a number of these organizations have now chosen and resorted to conducting the site-based training program, right, starting from the grassroots level. Even the workers that you have at the site, they are also being sensitized about this. Now, obviously, you can't go and start talking to a worker in terms of uh, uh, you know, the kind of scientific principles and things like that. There are many challenges, as you, you can see. There are lingual challenges. There are, of course, the uh, challenges of comprehension and understanding and lack of background as far as the scientific part is concerned. So what we do, that uh, it is almost like teaching a child how to study and how to speak a language. And you start with the primer. So the primer part has already been commenced. And uh, more and more workmen are actually in a position to understand that this is what they ought to do or this is what they ought not to do. And that is the first step. Now, we are looking at this particular uh, series of workshops that we are organizing to bring in more and more people from the industry. And now this is the time to take them over the level of... Uh, uh, you can say initial education or primary education, now to uh, secondary education. Now, you can't basically instill the things in the minds and hearts of the people right in day one. It is not possible. Uh, there are old habits which die very, very uh, late and, and things like that. Now, I give you an example. I started my career, professional career, as a construction engineer uh, way back in the 70s. At that point in time, 
even to have any worker you know your expectation to have any worker who would wear the helmets or jackets safety jackets or for that matter use the sling when they were working on the heights i'm talking about the safety part of it forget about the carbon footprints and ecological issues nobody knew about that even engineers also had no clue so that was actually the normal and now i can tell you that barring a few exceptions uh, the workers themselves have started demanding that they will not go to the work unless otherwise they have at least the rudimentary safety gear available with them so what we have to look at is in a on a paradigm shift and rather than going theoretical rather than basically conducting such kind of uh, you know high level seminars and workshops of course they have to be there but then other than that we have to translate the whole thing into uh, some kind of comprehensible modules so that through practice they understand that this is what they ought to do or this is what they ought not to do uh, dr kumar spoke about you know the skilling program that cidc launched way back in 1998 as a matter of fact we were uh, incorporated in 1996 and it took us about year year and a half to prepare the basic modules and let me tell you it was a herculean task because to have the basic trades like masonry carpentry bar bending and i am talking about the trade part of it is nothing beyond that it took us some time it took us a lot of practitioners who were there to convert them into the kind of trainers and teachers to have some rudimentary uh, string of uh, training places and so on and so forth now let me tell you this whole program has expanded to cover almost 52 trades and you have this as a national flagship program and there are many organizations who have entered into this field and they are also conducting the similar kind of training programs of course the standardization has always been done by cidc so there when 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 a qualified engineer will look at the kind of training program they'll say oh it's so simple we understand everything oh sure you do understand you know it's almost like we going and looking at the kind of table of alphabets yes we know there are alphabets for that matter because somebody when we were just uh, children uh, and we did not know about the alphabets taught us and from there of course many other things started happening you started forming the words sentences uh, grammar you started speaking and several things you know so uh, these are basically the kind of uh, things that are happening but very silently the whole thing is moving now the appeal that i have to make to all of you is that whichever domain you are in and wherever you see a situation like that and if anybody is looking for any kind of support in this direction you could possibly ask them to come and see us immediately because something parallelly that we are now doing is based on today's discussion and otherwise also there is plenty of material available with us we are now making special modules for the training of these workmen which are simply focusing on environmental and ecological issues only they are not to be explained that this is what we are trying to teach them but we have to tell them that this is how you should start practicing now this is a new normal that you there there is a second part of it also no matter whatever you do fact of the life is that unless otherwise it becomes part of the overall procurement system it it doesn't it doesn't really make any impact for that matter now that is where you require the architects that is where you require the design engineers that is where you require the people who draft the contract documents and you require the governments for that matter project owners for that matter who are willing to expect accept that these are the kind of regulatory changes that they are bringing in as far as the procurement is concerned now suppose if it is made some kind of an essential condition that you should have at least about 10% of the workers who have been trained specifically into these particular trades those who are holding a certificate believe you me it will catch like fire and this will go everywhere because this is going to define whether the execution agency will be allowed and will be permitted to really execute the work or not so you have to have regulatory support you need to have the kind of intellectual support and you need to have people who can come together and start building of people that is the process of building of people you see when i was i was 
I going to the uh, you know technical institute, and I went to IIT Kanpur. There were five IITs in the whole of the country, and the oldest of them was hardly about 15 or 16 years old. Matter of fact, I went to IIT Kanpur, which was about 10 years old. I am from the 10th batch, and before IITs came in, you had very few engineering colleges in the country, and now you look at the situation. You have something like 4,000 AICT approved engineering colleges, some 36 or 37 IITs, and many other institutions of excellence. So we have to basically bring it to the critical masses. And the position from where it can come to the critical masses is none other than the workmen. So you have raised a very good point, and we have, we have been silently working at that. Believe you me, at the end of the sixth, workshop that we have and the national conference that we have, we will definitely have a consensus created as to what exactly should be the national policy to go about uh, looking at the implementation part of it. And that is what is going to make the change. I hope I am clear to you. Yes, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. Right, sir. Right. So, Dr. Kumar, I think if there are no more questions, uh, we are... Uh, uh, you know, quite past uh, the lunch time, and everybody must be yes. feeling a bit hungry. So, all I can do is thank you so much. You all uh, basically made my day today, and the day of Mr. Aditya Narayan Singh also, and all the speakers were excellent. The kind of inputs that you have given were absolutely nice, and I especially appreciated. Uh, okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Makija. Thank you, sir. Mr. Makija is actually the president sir, sir, of the very nice, very nice, sir. Thank you, thank you Makija ji. Thank you. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. So it was lovely to have you, and uh, we look forward to have your participation in other seminars also. Of course, the blend is going to be somewhat different in the sense that we are going to be bringing in many more construction companies so that they are sensitized. And then in the next subsequent level, we will basically hold it for the work persons also. Even the work persons have to be uh, sensitized about these things. And needless to say, the manuals, etc. will be prepared and we'll take care of it. So thank you very much. And it was so, so beautiful to have all of you. And a very good day to you. And uh, everyone who is here, thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank sir. You, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank you, thank thank you, you sir. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. We'll be in touch for the subsequent workshops as well. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am.